Thank you and welcome to this session. Uh, before I get into some questions with uh, Mr. Schenken, uh, he and I will chat back and forth for about 20 minutes and then we would welcome your questions for another 10 minutes or so. Um, let me just broadly say that uh, Mr. Schenken brings um, to the writing of the Kentucky Cycle an unusual background. Uh, in addition to being a writer of long standing, he has written numerous one-act plays and several full-length plays. Uh, he's also been an actor uh, and acted extensively in regional theater and in New York. Uh, he's acted a great deal on the West Coast. He's also functioned in various other ways behind the scenes. So the experience that he has uh, I think enriches the writing of the Kentucky Cycle and um, as, as you will see when you experience it, I think you'll understand why it is that it received the, the Pulitzer Prize uh, in 1992 being the first American play to receive that prize before a New York production. Robert, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I probably ought to say, um, uh, but I enjoy doing, I have done this kind of thing before, and I particularly enjoy doing it with groups like these. I think almost uh, everyone in the audience uh, has read something um, about the Kentucky Cycle. Uh, so they come with some little knowledge of its content um, and of its approach. But I think it would be, um, very helpful if you were to tell us, as the playwright, what is the Kentucky Cycle about? The Kentucky Cycle is a two-part, nine-play uh, series um, uh, tracing the fictional history of three families in the eastern Kentucky portion of Appalachia from 1775 to 1975. It's performed in two parts. Uh, either in consecutive evenings or in what we call marathon, all-day marathon sessions. Each part is roughly three hours. It's performed by an ensemble company of uh, 12 what I think of as principal actors and then nine choral parts. These uh, 12 principal actors uh, play all of approximately 75 uh, named characters in the play. So you see see the actors transform in front of you and play a wide range though. In other words, people will be playing their own grandmother and their own granddaughter, their great-grandsons and their great-grandfathers. Why did you title it uh, The Kentucky Cycle? The event that was the, uh, the genesis of the play was an accidental journey to the Cumberland in 1981. I was working uh, as an actor at Actors Theatre of Louisville at the Humana Festival, which is an uh, internationally renowned theatre conference, doing a play written by a Kentuckian set in eastern Kentucky. And one night after the show, I fell into conversation with an individual who had seen the play, who uh, had run a health practice in eastern Kentucky. And we got to talking about the region and his experiences. And he was going back for a visit and invited me to tag along. And so I went with really no expectations of what I would see, uh, no uh, preconceptions. <coughs> it was uh, a very profoundly moving weekend, a cathartic experience. Um, this individual had set up a series of nurse teams, out, an outreach program, so a pediatrician, um, to bring um, medicine to the people, and a preventative medicine uh, outlook. We hooked up with one of the few teams that was remaining and joined her on her rounds. And the, uh, the poverty I, I saw that day was extraordinary. Um, it was profound, and it was probably made all the more uh, poignant because, of course, the clients being serviced were children on this. Um, that evening, we, we stayed with some other friends of his, the, the owner of a modest by region standard coal operation who lived into quite different circumstances. And uh, I was so uh, overwhelmed with what I'd seen, I couldn't help talking about it. And, and his reaction was interesting. 
this is a, a native Kentuckian, uh, he said, uh, in essence, these people are lazy and ignorant and that's why they suffer. And it was the, the absolute lack of any kind of community or compassion, even though these people didn't live all that far apart physically and weren't all that far apart socially in terms of generations. Um, there was something so striking about that division and a, 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 a division that was made even more poignant by the landscape, which uh, functioned almost as a metaphor for this. It was, uh, one and the same time, some of the most extraordinarily beautiful mountain scenery that I have ever experienced, and at the same time, some of the most devastated. You would turn a corner, and, and the other part of the mountain would have been strip mined away. And for those who have never had the experience of seeing a strip mine operation or the results of one, it is uh, a lunar-like result. Um, I, I should say that, that that experience, that confrontation that I had there in eastern Kentucky, I could have had anywhere in the country. I could have had it here in Washington, D.C. I could have had it in Los Angeles. I could have had it in Manhattan. I could have had it in Texas, where I grew up. I happen to have it in eastern Kentucky. What I think was significant about having it there is that is Kentucky's special significance in the history of this country as the gateway to our frontier, the idea of the American frontier, the Cumberland Gap through which we moved westward. That added a special significance to that experience that I wasn't aware of at the time, but soon came to appreciate. I came away from this experience needing compelled to understand why, compelled to understand what had happened here, to explain this to myself in some kind of satisfactory way. And I began to read widely about the region. Uh, and uh, one of the many authors that uh, I read, and certainly the most significant, was a man named Harry Caudill, um, a native Kentuckian environmentalist, social activist, legislator, novelist, a man of all letters and seasons. He wrote a book called Night Comes to the Cumberland, which is a history of the region, which is so well written, so colorful, so rich, so full of such extraordinary characters, acts of enormous violence and, and uh, heroism. It seemed inherently theatrical and quintessentially American. What I was beginning to feel, although not able to, to articulate then, was the idea of the frontier. Uh, moving through this. Um, that's how this began. That's, that's where it started. One might still play around with the idea of calling this the American cycle. Uh, I think what I'm really after, what, what I discovered ultimately, because this was a whole process of discovery, which uh, uh, was part of the joy of working on it, was the idea of coming to an American mythology, its genesis, its evolution, and its presence in our lives today. Uh, it was wrestling with that that I think is in large part what people respond to across the country to the peace and what, what takes it out of any kind of regional uh, uh, focus and gives it a national one. Mm -hmm. To what degree is the work fiction? Well, the, the context for the plays are his historically accurate as I could make them. That is to say, um, certainly the uh, uh, emergence of white men in the region and the clash of culture between the Native American and the white inarguably happened. Uh, the Civil War is a fact of, of history. Um, the, uh, the land boom bust speculation after the War of 1812, the rise of organized labor, in the, uh, the coming of the coal companies into Appalachia, the rise of organized labor, and the decline of the UMW are historical facts. Um, within that, however, everything is invented. Everything is fiction. Of the 75 characters that I alluded to, there are only two that are historical figures. Uh, a famous American labor leader, Mother Jones, and a famous Confederate a guerrilla fighter named Quantrill, William Clark Quantrill. And, and even there, I've not pretended to create any kind of, of um, 
well-rounded biographical uh, uh, portrait. Uh, I very much have a point of view about these people and I'm using them for specific reasons. So all of the events, all of the characters, all of the plot, all of that is entirely fictional. I was struck uh, strongly by the way in which you use certain images throughout the play. Uh, one of them is a um, musical watch. Another one is imagery of, of blood and um, uh, imagery of stars. Um, can, are you able to say to what degree those things flowed out of you in the process of working as opposed to the degree to which you planned those things? Most of, of what you have alluded to uh, has its origins in a place that I, I don't understand and don't know. I mean, they happen as a part of the process of creating. Uh, at a certain point in the development, it becomes conscious, and then I begin to manipulate it. I begin to say, oh, I've used this here. How can I, by placing it here in ironic juxtaposition, what kind of comment do I make, or how do I amplify that? After I came out of the region and was so jazzed about this, I couldn't find a way in. I couldn't find a way to begin this, and I set it aside for two to three years and just read. And then I, I, um, I met this extraordinary woman that I married, and, uh, and I wrote a play for her as a wedding gift. And she was an actress at the time. And, and in that play, I took an anecdote of Caudle and amplified it into a play, and I created a family, the Rowans. And I thought, well, that's it. That's how I can tell this story. I will follow this family and their very human, very real interactions and struggles, and by that I can expand upon the broader themes that are at, at work here. Um, then I discovered that there were two other families. I mean, I just wrote them one day, these two other families. And where I had thought the play might be three plays, it became six and then nine plays. And then I realized that there was, in fact, yet another character here all along, and that was the land. And, and it's as strong a character in the play as, as any of the humans that walk across it, buy it, barter it, and sell it. Um, there were a series of discoveries like that. Uh, some of the imagery I can easily trace to a source, biblical or otherwise. Uh, others of it, I don't know where that comes from. Uh, I couldn't offer any explanation. Once it's there, once it's out of my unconscious and on the page, then I'm conscious of it, and then I begin to manipulate it. I begin to expand upon it. I begin to play with it. So. Sounds a downright spiritual to me. Well, <laughs> I don't. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to dissuade anyone from that. I mean, I, I, the process of writing, like any creative process, is, you know, part just sweat, labor, and part just revelation. And where that revelation comes from is anyone guess. If you're a Freudian, then it's your unconscious. And if you're a Christian, then it's from God. And, and I, I don't know where I fall in that continuum, uh, actually. And I'm not sure I want to question it too, too closely. Uh, for fear that I'll kill the gift, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, it, it, it was, a, a, everything I know about theater and everything that happened to me during the long process of developing it, the last 10, 12 years now, is in that play in one form or another. When you tell a story over 200 years, when you tell a story over, I think, six or seven generations, well, then you have possibilities to do things, to explore movements that just aren't possible in your normal two hours traffic on the stage. It sounds um, like an epic. It is, and that is exactly what it is. This is an American epic. Uh, it takes six hours because our story as a people, who we are, how we came to be what we are, is that complex, it's that rich, it's that demanding. It insists on a certain amount of time to tell it. If you're gonna respect the story, you have to give it that time. Now, that's not to say that I was in any way casual about the kind of theatrical experience I was creating or the sort of demands I was gonna put on an audience. This thing is, 
very, very consciously and tightly constructed to draw the audience along, to carry them along, to keep them asking the question, what happens next? But neither was I going to just trim this play to fit any kind of preconceived Procrustean production bed. I mean, six-hour plays are not exactly the vogue, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> because they're, they're a challenge to produce. They are a challenge to produce in. But my feeling was all I had to do was find one person who was ready to produce it, who would say yes to it, and I would be OK. And I did in Elizabeth Huddle at the uh, Seattle's Intamon Theater. She read the play in a weekend, called immediately and said, I have to produce this. If I have to, if I have to hawk my season, I will produce this play. Isn't it correct that they did an entire season on your set? Well, what, what they did, I'll tell you what they did. She didn't have to hawk her, her season, uh, in large part because of the largesse of the Fund for New American Plays in the Kennedy Center, which gave us the largest grant in their history. What she did do was play the rest of her season on a single unit set. Uh, and, I mean, that's an extraordinarily courageous action particularly for a theater that does not have enormous resources. Um, Gordon Davidson saw the play, called my agent from the plane, flying back to LA, and said, I want this to be the centerpiece of the 25th anniversary, and moved it there. And, and it is that production, that version of the script that won the Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. um, from reading the play, it's my <laughs> guess uh, that actors um, love you for the dialogue you give them. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if, first of all, is that true? Yeah. And the whole modesty, <laughs> is that true? And, and secondly, uh, if it is true, to what degree is that the result of your having been an actor for a long time? My being an actor is an enormous part of, of this play and how I work as a writer. I say the lines out loud as I write them. I taste them in my mouth. I see characters moving through space in three dimensions. I visualize how an action takes place. So I, I come to it as an actor. I think in terms of character motivation. I think in terms of objective. I think in terms of action. And what I like about theater, what I love as an actor, is the moment where you transform in front of an audience, where you become something else. I think that's what audiences respond to the most strongly out of a theatrical experience, is that moment where the actor transforms in front of them. And I have written a play which demands that, which says, OK, you are going to play anywhere from seven to 10 different roles in this play. You are going to play anywhere from four to seven different theatrical genres and styles. You are going to play in nine different historical periods with all that that entails. I mean, this is a wonderful challenge for an actor. And I am lucky that I have as talented a company of actors as I do, headed not least by Stacy Keach, who is, I think, one of the great American stage actors. You've also been blessed in your director, haven't you? Yeah, oh, unquestionably. Uh, Warner Shook is the man who has uh, directed this play since its second workshop at the Mark Taper Forum. So he has now been with the show since 1989. Uh, we arrived at the scene design on this as a result of intensive meetings over a period of six months prior to that first production. I'm, I'm in, as invested in that set as Michael Olich is. Mm -hmm. And it's a credit to this director that he, that he was that uh, giving to the work that uh, unego involved that he can permit, that in, in fact, encourage that kind of collaboration. So he's an, an enormous part of this, as is my dramaturg, uh, Tom Bryant, who has also been with the play uh, since 1989. I mean, it's, it's been a wonderful collaboration. Some of the themes that you're dealing with in the play are um, violence and greed and the destruction of land and courage and integrity. Those are ones that occur to me immediately. I'm wondering if there is one of those that you are most concerned about illuminating for us. I'm interested in 
American mythology, and in particular the, what I think of as the heart of that mythos, the myth of the frontier and how that lives in us today. I think we're at a, at a very critical moment in American history uh, where people, there is a, a, a general and broad comprehensive sense of dissatisfaction among people with the way things are and a sense that things must be different but no real sense of, of what to do. Joseph Campbell, um, when he talked about mythology, he said that when the, myth, when the mythos underlying a culture no longer functions in a healthy way for that culture, two things happen. One is a profound sense of disassociation. I think that's what we're experiencing right now. The other thing he went on to say is that what then follows is a search for a new more healthy, more potent mythos. And I would like to think that the Kentucky cycle is a part of that response, mm. that critical reexamination of what exists and that search for something to replace it. So that's what okay. I'd like to say. Are there questions that people would like to raise? Yes, sir. Usually there's not such a long uh, period between the first time it, it plays in the Kennedy Center in the opening. Here it's been two weeks or so. I'm wondering what's taking place. You know, what is the reason for this? For this well, the, long the, the reason for the kind of length of um, the preview process here is that technically the play is very demanding. I mean, it is six hours. It's not your. It's not a normal two hours. So just to technically cover ourselves, to work through, to break in the crews. To, to, I mean, the cues in this show are extraordinary. I think there are something like 400 to 500 light cues. The play is musically scored like a film more than a, a theater piece. That is to say, there is music or sound of some kind under almost everything. Uh, we are also adjusting to a proscenium for the first time. We have played the play previously in both previous productions in Thrust. Now we're in a proscenium. The set has adjusted. The blocking must adjust. Our effects must adjust. So um, that, that really, in a nutshell, is what we're doing. It, for me, in terms of the text, uh, I rewrote one of the plays completely after the Pulitzer because I was not satisfied with its effect. In the rehearsal process, which preceded our arrival here in Washington, I continued to refine that text. That meant revising, cutting, uh, rewriting some pieces. Uh, in these last two weeks of previews, my work has been minimal. It's really been a line, excising a line here, changing a line there. Uh, do I have enough exposition for the audience to follow us through? Am I giving away too much? I'm, I'm now sitting out there with you, the audience, watching you as much as the play, going, now, is, are they following me here? Are they, are they responding the way I want them to? And if not, why not? Uh, I'm spending as much time looking at performance now as I am in text. So that's, uh, and it's really been a blessing that we've had this much preview time. Uh, in the opening scene of the first act, you show uh, the Indians. Now don't, uh, give away, don't give away my plot here. <laughs> you've, got, you've got people here who haven't seen it or read it. But, but part of what I was saying, though, I was just wondering what you were thinking of at that time when uh, you had the Indians uh, kind of uh, wiped out or annihilated at the very beginning. Well, I think, as I said, I talk about uh, historical context. I think um, that it is a matter of historical record what happened to the Native American, uh, particularly on the East Coast. I mean, the Trail of Tears is one of the less glorious episodes uh, in American history. This is the forced relocation of the Cherokee Nation um, to Oklahoma from their native land in direct violation of their treaties. So uh, certainly that was in my mind. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel that I, I could write that any other way given the general historical context. Were you criticized in any manner for that? Never have been. Never. No one has ever. Mm -hmm raise that as an issue at all. Yes, in the back. The Washington Post covered some of the uh, so-called self-appointed natives who had criticisms of, the, I don't know how to describe it or characterize it without putting uh, connotations on it that I probably don't intend or want to. But w what is your response if you're, as I assume, familiar with what their comments oh, of course and criticisms I'm were? I, I think it is impossible to write anything of high profile these days that is not followed by controversy, and we are, after all, in Washington, D.C. Uh, 
I certainly wouldn't want to speculate on the motives of anybody involved, but if you insist on looking at this play as some kind of historical document, as biography, as history, then you will be disappointed. It's not. It is a work of art. It is a work of imagination. And, uh, and you must approach it on those terms. Uh, I certainly uh, feel that uh, my approach to the underlying material was an honest one. Uh, uh, it was full of integrity, and I came to the subject as an advocate uh, for the people of the region and the region itself. So uh, I'm not surprised that someone doesn't like my play. Uh, I'll be surprised if someone doesn't like it in New York, uh, who doesn't have anything to do with uh, Kentucky. Um, but uh, I can't say I've lost a lot of sleep over it. Um, those of you who are new to the Spotlight on Theater series, um, I hope that you have enjoyed this introductory session uh, and that you will realize from the way in which Robert has shared things with us this evening that one of our efforts in the series is to help people who want to know more about the process. And I hope that you will join me in thanking Robert for a splendid evening.